What's good, family? It's your man, Daryl the second. I hope you're doing well. Um, I am getting ready for bed, but I want to drop this word that God gave me a couple of days ago. Before I move forward, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you for depositing it in my soul, in my spirit, and I thank you for your presence, your truth, and just you being with me, Father. Father, I thank you for your grace and your mercy, and I thank you for your life, for providing life, not just in our lungs, Lord, but life in our spirit and giving us purpose. As I speak this truth, I pray that your will would be done and I would go in the direction you desire and anything not of you and me, I pray you cleanse me of it. Any doors open that should not be, shut them in the name of Jesus and I will be led by your spirit and your direction you want me to go in Jesus' name, amen. Now, this may cut off for some of you guys because these reels are quick, so you can find this full video on YouTube at Daryl the II or on Facebook, Daryl the II. Um, you can click on the link or also on Instagram. Um, so what I want to say to you is, on the other side of your obstacle is your promotion. Let me say that again. On the other side of your obstacle is your promotion. You know, in life, too, pe too often people want to receive a blessing, but they don't want to go through the challenge of obtaining that blessing. And really, the challenge is God's way of equipping you and preparing you um, to face the challenge. Uh, let me let me. I know what I'm trying to say. The challenge, the obstacle in front of you, if God brings you to that challenge, it's because he prepared you beforehand with other challenges. That's what I meant to say. And so when you face an obstacle that God brings you to, he has not abandoned you and he has not left you there powerless. He is your power. He is your source. And he has equipped you with whatever tools he has placed in you so that you can overcome and prevail over the obstacle in front of you. And so it's up to you to decide whether you believe that or if you simply turn around, turn tail and go back to where you came from. Sorry, I feel like something in my eye. And so the story I'm going to be coming from is from 1 Samuel chapter 17, David and Goliath. Now, um, I have an analogy to follow after this, so it's very interesting. So I'm going to read this first. And then we'll go there. Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Sako, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Sako and Azekah and Ephes Demim. These are landmarks that I'm naming. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and they encamped in the valley of Elah. And they drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels and a shield bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel, and he said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and you the servants of Saul, who was the king at the time? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, David was the son. Hang on, let me turn the page of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse and who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to the battle. The names of his sons, his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the third Shema. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. In other words, they were down at the battle. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near and presented himself forty days, morning and evening. Then Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves, and run to your brothers at the camp. So I'm going to stop there. What I'm doing is... The Bible's laying out what you just heard about Goliath challenging Israel, but then it's going to where David is located, which is he's at his house with his father, and it's setting the scene for how he comes and hears this challenge. So moving forward. Okay. So th then Jesse said to his son, David, take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these 10 loaves and run to your brothers at the camp. 
and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand and see how your brothers fare and bring back news of them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper and took the things and, and went as Jesse had commanded. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to the fight and shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army, and David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words, so David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? So what you're seeing here is there's a reward for whoever conquers this obstacle, this giant. OK, uh, where am I? OK, um, and then he goes, For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same manner, in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? So his older brother hating on him. Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing, and these people answered him as the first ones did. Now, when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him for you are a youth and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor and he put a bronze helmet on his head and he also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these for I have not tested these. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beast of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of, the, of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day, I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. <clears throat> then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, 
and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of his sheath, out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Now, there's more to be said. This is a really great story. But I wanted to read that to you because in this moment, David's life changed. David took on the challenge of facing the obstacle in front of him. He trusted God and he knew he was equipped to handle this obstacle because God had prepared him in the wilderness, in the sheepfold, when he was a shepherd protecting his father's flock. He said it himself. I went after the bear and the lion when they took when they took a sheep and God was the one who delivered me from them. He protected me from them. And the same guy who protected me from them will protect me from him. You see, David understood who he was. David understood who God was. David had past experiences to remind him that no matter what he faced, God's hand of protection was around him. David also understood that this was an opportunity for promotion. For you see, him hearing the rewards that came with conquering this giant was a great motivator. He was already upset that this giant would disrespect his God, the God of his people, Israel. But he also understood that no one else would step up for the challenge. And he said, I'll do it. And when he did it, God delivered him and his life changed and he was promoted immediately. In fact, if you read on as they're celebrating, it goes. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands. And David, his 10,000s, he was getting a lot of attention and became famous overnight. Now, for those of you who don't know, Saul becomes jealous of David and tries to kill him. But I won't focus on that tonight. I wanted to simply say, if you want to be promoted, if you want to be elevated, you have to face the trial. There is no way around it. You cannot elevate to a position of authority or influence until you go through the process that the Lord wants to take you. How dare you want the, the, the success and the glory in your life, but you're not willing to go through the hardships. And let me specify, ultimately, all glory goes to God. But what I'm saying is the splendor of what he provides, that, 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 that statement of glory in the sense that we know it to be the prestige. Let me say that, the prestige, the honor, the nobility. How dare you want the exaltation, but you're not willing to go through the humbleness. How dare you want the mountaintop, but you won't travel through the valley. God don't work like that because the valley is preparation for the mountaintop. There are life lessons that you get in the valley that you don't get at the mountaintop. And there are mountaintop experiences that you don't get at the valley and lessons up there. You need them both. It's a, it's a balance. And so God takes you through the hard times so that you can enjoy the beautiful sweet times. But the hard times are meant to be experienced that being as blessings as well. It's about the experience, not always the destination. And so I'm going to give you an example. Um, one thing uh, the other day, um, I was talking to my mother on the phone. It was a funny story. And she was going to go outside and just get some fresh air. But there was a grasshopper by the door. And she was like, eat, there's a, there's a bug by the door. And, and she, as she looked, the, the grasshopper kept inching closer to the door. So she didn't want to go outside. And I said to her, I said, you know, and I, I realized this reminds me of David and Goliath. It was like, God gave me that word in that moment. How this enemy is advancing towards you, taking territory, daring you to come out there and challenge it. I was like, so mom, what you going to do? And so the same analogy occurred in this story I read to you. And that's what happens to you. The enemy will try to advance and take territory from you, territory that God ordained for you to have. And you have a choice. You can stay in the house or you can go outside and face your enemy. You face your enemy. God will give you the victory. Now, we prayed and my mom came to a solution on how to deal with it. It was a funny story. But I say the same thing to you. When you face your opposition, are you inquiring of the Lord how you should respond? Are you walking in faith knowing that you can overcome that situation? David was very skilled with his sling and stone because, as I said before, he had used it to prepare to prepare, uh, protect the flock of sheep because he was a shepherd. And that protection was his preparation for this moment, a pivotal moment where his life shifted and changed overnight and continued to because he kept getting promoted. But with your with your blessings come challenges. T.D. Jakes has a question. He, uh, he says, can you stand to be blessed? Because when you're blessed, when you're elevated, you will have people who are upset with you. And when you've done nothing wrong, you will have people who are jealous of your blessing, but they have no idea about the preparation you had undergone to be where you are. The Bible says the Lord make us rich and he adds no sorrow. That is true. But he says, blessed are you when men revile you, speak all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. For great is your reward in heaven. For as they did to the prophets before you, um, so as they do to you, they did to the prophets before you. 
that's he said, be of good cheer. That means that's the sign of the spirit of God is upon you. I'm saying you're going to be blessed, but you'll be persecuted. Can you stand it? Can you stand it? That's what TDJ said, because honestly, if you are upset about being disliked, then you're going to have a hard time enjoying life because you're too preoccupied with what everybody else thinks. You can't live your life like that. There are people out there who have the intention of misunderstanding you. No matter what you do, that's what they're going to be. Why waste your time answering your critics? Let God be the one who deals with them. You pray for your enemies. Bless those who curse you. But don't get caught up in that silliness. Don't return evil for evil. Because in due season, God will deal with them. You pray for the salvation of their souls. Because God doesn't take it lightly when people mess with his children. And the Bible says, vengeance is mine, says the, excuse me, says the Lord, and I will repay them. So God will not allow you to go through all these unnecessary or these sufferings in vain. He will protect you just like he did David as you continue to read his story. And so if you're willing to have promotion, then you must go through the hardships, the challenges, and you must trust God and take him at his word and advance. And don't allow that cricket to keep you in the house, that grasshopper to keep you in the house. <clears throat> I always reference this movie, um, Shawshank Redemption. I don't know if you all have seen it, but you should. It's a great movie. It came out in the 90s. Uh, Morgan Freeman, Timothy Robbins, uh, Tim Robbins. It's based on a Stephen King movie, a uh, book. But a man was unjustly put in prison for something he did not do for years. And he underwent so much, so much in that prison. And during the course of his prison he, time, he discovered how to utilize his skills and acquire success. He was an accountant in his former life. So he was able to benefit the warden in um, tax issues and all these things. And one day, another inmate came in the prison who was able to prove that this inmate, the first one I told you about, was innocent of the crime he was convicted of. But when the warden got wind of this, he killed that individual so that uh, the first inmate could not be free. Well, this set that inmate off and he began to plot and plan and he got out of that prison. But in the course of his getting out, he had to climb through sewage and filth to get to where he wanted to go. But when he got out, Thankfully, it rained and it washed all that nastiness off of him, but he had a plan. He was an accountant. He had created an individual that wasn't real and went to banks and collected large sums of money and took off somewhere where no one knew where he was. Brilliant strategy. But he went through all that hardship and headache to get to the level of success that he was meant to be. And God is saying, are you willing to go through the challenges? Are you willing to go through the hardship, the difficulties, the, the, the hard situations? The uh, moments where you're talked about and disliked, are you willing to? There's that, That's a question. You see, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane, from my understanding, it, um, I think it's the same term, Mount of Olives, it means olive press. And when you get olive oil, the olive itself has to go into this contraption that crushes it so that the juice can come out. It presses, it's the olive press. So that's how you get the olive oil. It's just like wine. You stomp the grapes so the juice could come out. So when the anointing is in your life and it flows, there is a crushing that you got to go through to be prepared for where God wants to take you with that anointing. Too many people want to prostitute the gift that God has given them, wants to prostitute the anointing. That's why sometimes as a believer, you'll have people who see the anointing in your life and they'll be bothered by it because they themselves don't have it. Or they themselves are trying everything in their own human effort and they don't understand how you're capable of succeeding even when you have such opposition in your life. But you know why. Because the Bible says, greater is he who is in me than he that's in the world. You have the power of the spirit of God who lives inside of you. And when you go through the hard times and the difficulties, you are an example and an, a wit as a witness to other people who may not know the Lord as well as others who do. So when you face your Goliath, when you face your opposition, instead of running away like too often people do, run towards your giant because God has armed you and prepared you for that battle. And when you go towards your giant, you go as God equipped you. David put on the armor that Saul tried to put on him and he realized this is not me. And he went out there as he was, a shepherd. God did not make a mistake when he made you. So quit trying to redefine, recreate, reimagine who you are and simply be. Often God puts pressure in our life so that the greatness on the inside of us can be released. You're sitting here complaining about external circumstances, not realizing that God is using them to strengthen you and to prepare you so he can propel you. And he wants to use you in a fashion that is so amazing that he gets the glory, but you get to walk in destiny. Why are you running from your challenges? 
Why are you running from your destiny? He has prepared you. Don't run. He's got you. You know, I think about the story of Joseph. This is another word. His pain was preparation for his purpose. You know, his brothers had turned their back on him. They hurt him. Um, but had he not have gone through that, he never would have arrived in Egypt to be prepared to be second in command to help the entire world when that famine came. God used that pain to get him where he was supposed to be. A lot of times we like to sit back and want a comfortable life and we don't want to go through anything. We want to say, what was me? But turbulence is necessary for us to elevate. Just like a plane when it goes in the ground, I mean, it flies in the, in the, um, in the sky, it has to go against the wind. If it goes with the wind, it for some reason, it doesn't elevate. But when it goes against the wind, it's the resistance that helps it get up there. I heard somebody explain it pretty well. My point is, God uses the resistance to bring something out of us that we didn't otherwise realize we had. We have a power in us, but sometimes discomfort or sometimes comfort allows us to sit in dormancy and we become lazy and we collect dust and we don't utilize what God has given us. And so God loves us so much, he'll light a flame under our behind to get us to activate what he's put on the inside of us. So when he's allowing your circumstance to become uncomfortable, he's using it for your good. The Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise a standard. When the enemy, when your enemies try to oppose you, God is so awesome. He can take what they use against you and work it for your good. Do you understand what I'm saying? Every attempt to hinder you, God is saying, I got you. Do you trust me? You see what I'm saying? I don't know if you know the story of the donkey. A donkey fell in a whale and its owner couldn't get it out. So he just decided to bury the donkey alive. So he started burying the donkey. The donkey kept getting dirt on his head. The donkey would knock the dirt off of himself. And this kept going on for a while. Eventually, the donkey had put the dirt alongside around him that it began to gradually elevate him because it was under his feet. And he got to the point where he got to the top where he was able to get out. God will use your situations of obstacles to elevate you. So when you see troublesome moments occur, don't run because God's trying to do a miracle in your midst. What if Moses had run from his Red Sea experience and ran back to Egypt? He would have never realized that God would have told, he wouldn't have heard God say, what is that in your hand? And reminded him of his staff and have him lift it so that God could part the Red Sea. He would have missed out on that amazing miracle. The Bible says in Ephesians, I think it's chapter three or 429, says now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. Are you in accordance with God? Are you in agreement with God? Are you tapping into the power that he has placed on the inside of you? Stop running from your trials because God's using your trials to elevate you, to help you walk in promotion and go from glory to glory to glory and go higher than you ever imagined. But it requires faith. Because the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please him because you got to believe he exists and believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And you can say, I believe in God, but demons believe. Are you walking by faith and not by sight? The Bible says faith without works is dead. I encourage you today, take him at his word. And when he takes you to your giant, go face him. I got another scripture, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. That's submission. Are you trusting him? Are you letting him lead you? Are you allowing him to guide you? It's okay to be misunderstood. Everybody ain't gonna get you. Your assignment is not to get everybody to get you. Your assignment is to do the will of the father. Jesus said, not all who say, Lord, Lord am I, but those who do the will. So you can say, Lord, Lord, but are you doing the will of the father? Because if you ain't, you got to ask yourself, do you really know him? Do you belong to him? Let me read another verse. This is good. Okay. Unless the Lord builds the house, this is Psalm 127, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is, is the fruit of the womb is a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. 
I'm gonna read one more and I'm gonna close. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. Your children like olive plants all around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord, will, the Lord bless you out of Zion. And may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Yes, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. That's a blessing. That's Psalm 128. In closing, uh, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Do you believe in Jesus today? Because if you do, you will have everlasting life. If you don't, you won't. God does not want you to go to hell. But that is a real place. And it go anyone who goes there is because they don't have a relationship with the Lord. He said, it is not my will that man should perish. But he gives us free will to decide if we want to have free life, everlasting life that he provides, or if we want to go to hell. The Bible says, broad is the road that leads to destruction and narrow is the way that leads to salvation. And how few are those who find it? He also said, um, man, that, that scripture... Um, Oh, man. Oh, the gift of God. Oh, how does it go? My word. Um, oh, my word. I, I'm trying to quote it. Salvation is free. The gift of God. Um, oh, oh, my goodness. Oh, my Lord. Why can't I remember? Oh, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. There it is. And so this is a gift. Now, I explained the cost earlier because persecution comes with it. But he'll protect you. And as, he per as you're persecuted, you're blessed. He'll bless you. But the gift of God is eternal life. So here's what you have to do if you want to know. Jesus was, a, was the son of God. He is the son of God. He came to the earth as a, as a man. And he was 100% man and 100% God. But he bared with our weaknesses. He lived for 33 years. And he was tempted to sin just like we are. But he didn't. He was the perfect sacrifice. And he gave his life up to die on the cross for you and for me. Because our sins needed to be paid for. And there had to be someone who paid the cost and none of us could do it, but he could because he was perfect. He was the perfect sacrifice. He never sinned. So when he died, it was necessary for him to die so that he could atone for our sins, pay for our sins. He became a ransom for us. And when he died, he went to hell, took back the keys of death and uh, 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 he conquered death. Excuse me. Then he came back from the grave, revealed himself. Yeah, he took back the keys of death and he went back to heaven with his father, still pleading on our behalf because he is our mediator. But when you want to have salvation and be able to go to heaven and have your name in what is called the book of life, the only way to get to heaven is to have Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. That narrow route I was talking about a minute ago is through him and him alone. The Buddha is not going to get you into heaven. Muhammad is not going to get you into heaven. Confucius, none of that. You cannot earn your way into heaven. You must know Jesus. You must have an intimacy with him, have a relationship. And if you desire to have that, then simply repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. And I believe you were raised from the dead by God three days after. Come into my heart, Jesus. I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. Now, he is the son of God. I hope you believe that because he is the way, the truth and the life. We can even say, Lord, I believe you, the son of God. We can add that. But he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can get to the Father except through him. Now, if you did that, you are saved. The Spirit of God is in your heart, and you are sealed for the day of redemption. The next step is you want to get into a Bible-based church and really get connected to the fellowship so you can grow in your walk with Jesus. And then you want to get baptized in water because you must be born again of water as well as the Spirit. You were just born of Spirit, water's next. I pray this encouraged you. I believe it did because God spoke to my spirit. I know it did. And I know God's got a plan for your life. So you be blessed, you be encouraged, and you realize that on the other side of your obstacle, there is promotion. Daryl Alder the Second is my name. I'm on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. I can keep going because I'm a preacher and I have a lot to say. But Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word. Get the glory, get the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Check out Daniel 3. That'll bless y'all. That's in my spirit as well. Peace.